Greetings and welcome to another screencast from Dev Bootstrap. In today's video, we're going to cover dependency inversion principle. Dependency inversion principle is the final part of solid. It's the D in solid, this last one here. So in this series, we've already covered all of the previous principles of solid. So this kind of wraps up and concludes our series. So what is dependency inversion principle? Well, it states that essentially that high level modules should not depend on low level modules and both should depend on abstractions. Okay, well, that's rather abstract in its own right. So perhaps we should take a look at an example. And speaking of examples, before we do, there is this repository and inside the dip folder, or you can link to it from here as well, dependency inversion principle, you can basically open that up and there's a readme that basically shows you everything related to this topic. And you can try it out and clone the repo, which I've done here already. So back to the case at hand, an example. Okay. So basically what we end up with when we follow dependency inversion principle is a sort of a Russian doll type of infrastructure with our classes in our application. And so it's a combination of following the composite and the decorator patterns so that we end up with having a nice set of well-defined role-based interfaces that we can apply to our classes and we can then construct our application, we can basically build up our application as a composition of classes in this manner. So as you can see here, we are able to actually interact with our application like this. And this is made possible because of the abstractions that we make with our interfaces. And the core main two interfaces really is the iStore Reader interface and the iStore Writer interface, which we can now apply to the file store, the cache store, and the store logger classes. And then we can compose everything with the store logger so that it has the reader and writer implementation. This, in doing so, sort of makes the message store a little bit redundant, but we can see in the example that it still has its place in the application as a inter interface for the, uh, for the real world, if you like. So if we take a look at the interfaces, first of all, of course you're expecting to see this. The iStore reader has one method, right? One member, which is read. And the interface is that it's an ID that is a number. That's the input and the output or the return is a string. Pretty straightforward. And same again with the iStore writer. It's one member, save, takes a number and a message, string, and has a void return type. And so these are our two main interfaces for the application. And so we apply those interfaces to all the classes where we want to basically read and write. And so we start off with the base class of our application, which is the file store. This is the class that sits right at the base of our application. This is the class that essentially persists our data to a store, in this case, a file store. As you can see, it implements the reader and the writer interface and the constructor only needs to take the location, the directory of where the files will be stored. And the implementation of the save method, which is of course from the writer interface, is to simply write the file to disk. And the read method, which is implemented from the reader interface, is to simply read the file from disk. Uh, and that's it. That's as, that's as far as our file store goes, right? So next up the stack is the store cache. And here's where it gets interesting because the store cache not only implements the reader and the writer interface, but the constructor expects a instance of a class 
that implements writer and reader as well. And the way that this works is that the implementation of the writer interface, which is this save method here, calls the interface of the writer that's passed in. And the writer instance that's passed in is the file store. And so the store cache, when it calls this method here, is calling the method based on the fact that it implements the writer interface. And it doesn't care about the implementation, which takes us back to the whole idea of being able to swap out our classes for different implementations, but keeping the interface the same. So this writer, actually, at, the, at runtime, could be an SQL writer, it could be a key value store writer, it could be um, an Amazon Web Services S3 writer, but in this case, it's our humble file store writer, because that's what we're going to pass in in a minute when we see the actual implementation and the test later on. And of course, the read method here is the same approach. It takes the reader that's passed in and it calls the read method to get the value. Again, the class does not care what kind of reader it is, only that it implements the interface. And therefore, it can call the read method in confidence that it's going to behave in an expected way based on the interface based on the definition of the interface. Next up is the, uh, the logger. The logger class also implements the writer and the reader interface and also takes in the constructor an instance of writer and an instance of reader. And in the read method, it's going to call reader from the reader in, uh, in, uh, instance that's passed in here. And again, it doesn't care about the implementation. But actually what we know as software designers uh, and coders is that this read method is going to be called on the store cache. And we know that the store cache is going to then in turn call the read method of the file store. So this kind of goes down the chain of our composite application. And the same with the save method, it just simply calls the save method on the writer. And again, the class, the, the logger class doesn't care about the implementation, it just cares that the interface has been properly implemented. And so the logger does what it's supposed to do, which is logging out the various steps along the way. So it says, oh, I'm reading, and oh, I did not find that particular message, or I'm returning this message now, or I'm saving, and so on. So the lo logger takes care of all of those different logging actions. And of course, these methods here, like for example, did not find and returning, are defined here in the class itself, because this is, after all, the logger class. And right at the top of the stack is the message store. And as mentioned earlier, you can see it's pretty empty now. Like, there's actually no real need for this class anymore. Um, but we've implemented it anyway because, for example, we can do a check to see that the writer and the reader are not null. And, but you can see you know, here that the save method and the read method literally just call the save and read method on the underlying reader and writer classes. But as I mentioned, this class could be used for, say, adding other logic at this level of the stack. For example, could be related to authentication or authorization. Maybe certain users can read but not write, or vice versa. Or you may need to be authenticated to use this application. And maybe this is where you could put that kind of logic. Or you could put some kind of other transformation logic. Um, all kinds of things, but it allows you to stack up and build up your application a bit like Lego blocks in a way, 
so that you end up with what you want uh, at the end of the day. And so this is an example of building up these components into a working application. And you can see here that we create the file store, then we use an, that instance of the file store to create the cache. And notice we pass in file store, file store, because we are expecting the writer and the reader interface to be passed in separately at all the levels above this. So we pass in the file store to create the cache. We pass in the cache to the logger to create the logger. And we pass in the logger to the message store to create the, the message store. And any of these levels we could change. So for example, we could change the logger to a different type of logger, as I mentioned before. And that would not change the implementation. So we could change this to a Splunk logger, like this. And maybe now, if that class was defined, we would be logging to Splunk. Or down here, instead of saving and persisting to the file system, we might want to f save to S3. Again, if the class was defined, we could just run this, and voila, we're saving to S3. Um, so this is the composition of the application, and this is how we tested it. So we're now able to interact directly with the message store and through the interface call the save and the read methods to just check and verify that everything is running as expected. And so we can run this example as shown, and there we have it. It's running and saving and reading messages as expected. And this is the final step of our solid course. As you can see, we end up with an application that is very nicely decoupled, very nicely composable, and very testable, maintainable, and easy to read and understand what each part of the application does and what role it plays. And we are not breaking uh, or violating the Lizkov substitution principle. And we are not violating the single responsibility principle or the open-close principle. We're basically following and have followed throughout this course and refactored our application to be a truly solid application. So this concludes the solid course. The, I will do one more video, which goes into this folder here, the conclusion folder, which is the final solution. And it's the same as this solution, only I've written some tests in Jest, just to show you how to properly, let's say, properly test the application using a, a, t a mature testing framework like Jest, which means that then you can run these tests in a CI server like Travis. So I'll see you over in that video, and I hope that you like this video. Click the like button, click the subscribe button. Please share this video, and um, take care, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.